Bill. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's been a while in the making. I realized the first time we connected, I think it was February or March, and you just started at Blue Origin. And you said, Adam, hang on a second. Let me settle in. How's it been? How is it? What is it like to, to be settling in six months into your, your new position? You know, it's a, it's a very unique and, and fascinating company. You know, you, you make the jokes about working with rocket scientists, right? <laughs> that's, that's what I get to do every day. And it's, it's humbling to see how many smart and passionate people are about space and, and getting people and equipment up into space. So it's been, it's been a, a terrific ride, if you will. You're going to need to come up with a whole series of new jokes because that one is, is, is actually accurate and what an incredible mission to be on. For the audience, listen, this is a treat. Bill comes with, I think it's over 20 years experience from Intel to being the CMO of Honeywell. His focus has been on audience externally and internally. And Bill, this is going to be a hilarious episode. I'm going to introduce it in just a bit. The title though, is it possible to unify all audiences under one team? And we're going to take sides here. I'm going to prove that Bill doesn't exist, that he's a, a unicorn. It's not, not pop. And Bill is going to show us the way. So, Bill, are you ready for that kind of challenge? I'm ready. And uh, my daughter has a unicorn costume. I probably should have put it on for this uh, this episode. But, uh, yeah, I'm ready to roll. Let's do it. Would have been epic. Maybe do a picture, send it to me after. <laughs> but uh, I've been looking at the data for these episodes, and I see a major drop off about three minutes in. But then those who stay, stay for the entire duration. So I've been asked, Adam, please introduce the episodes with context. So here goes. Everyone settle in. It's a two-minute real quick context for the podcast. It's been about a year and three months, 75 episodes, okay? Single question, what is the future of HR initiatives? It's called the People Initiatives Podcast. We are now moving from season three, where we discuss the adoption of marketing inside the world of HR, to season four, where we're going to talk about running campaigns, from theoretical to practical. However, in the last couple of weeks, and I'm headed to a conference right after this podcast in San Francisco, there's been an interesting question that has emerged, which is if we're talking about the future of initiatives, why are we doing this? Where's HR headed? And in order to answer that question, Bill is going to give us his insights, but I want to present to you the way I see the world, where it's headed, okay? Some factual, some my guess estimates based on what I'm hearing. It's certainly moving from compliance. Okay, not moving like away and there's not compliance, it doesn't matter, it matters. But in addition to that, something else matters. And where's it moving to? That depends on the organization. In some cases, let's focus on our brand from customers to candidates. Employer brand is born. Very cool. Others are moving further into the employee experience, internal communications, benefits, raising those kinds of questions. Very cool. There's a new set of companies saying, HR is going to start to enable business growth. Ooh, that's great. But, and here I'm lending the plane bill. I know it was a little long-winded. We have a, all the way at the end of that spectrum, a holy grail in my view, which is one brand. Okay? It's all audiences under one team. Okay? A lot of you are like, ha, 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 this is not possible, right? Well, seriously, because this transcends the way we think about organizations the way it's structured. So now, for those of you who are not interested, you can bail. For those who are interested, all right, kind of let's all strap in because Bill and I are about to go at it. So Bill, where I want to begin is a little bit of your background. As the CMO of Honeywell, some of these things you, you've already done. This, this is your not your first time converging audiences, but could you introduce to the audience, what did you learn in your role at Honeywell? I think there was, um, this is Honeywell's really when I honed in on kind of the right strategy and focusing on messaging and integrated messaging. So um, very cool company in terms of the innovation the company does, um, executing all of those things. But what I learned was, number one, when I got there, there needed to be digitalization. You know, we were doing very paper things, even paper brochures, press releases, town halls for employees, those kind of things. And, and, you know, the, the lesson quickly was get to digital, find out how people like to consume their content, right? And so we would do polls with employees saying at home, just generally at home, how do you consume your news? How do you get your news? 
And you'd find out things like, well, I prefer video or I prefer short form or long form. And you'd put that all together and you'd start putting together a digital plan. And of course, the beauty of digital with, with Honeywell, Blue Origin, Intel, whomever, is if it's digital, you can measure it, right? It's ones and zeros. And now you're having conversations with the C-suite about actual data, what's working, what's not working, what are the insights from it? And it became very, very fascinating. And, and I, I think when we previously spoke, the attraction to me on the Honeywell job was every communications aspect and marketing aspect was in one cor- one group, right? So employee communications, executive communications, public relations, social media, marketing, advertising, you name it, uh, all under one group. And that was really attractive to me because as you said in the opening you know, comment, it, it's really one brand. And how do you build that brand? Oh, you, you, you didn't miss here, you folks listening. The CMO was just like in the previous position as a CMO was talking about doing polls to the employees. I, I know some brains may be breaking. So Bill, like to your knowledge, when you think about all the organizations in the world, I, I, I understand you, you, you can't have exact numbers, but what percentage understand this mm, and go further that attempt to bring this together? Because that's the ultimate experience management. When you look about, look at all audiences, one brand, what percent or how would you even get, if you don't want to guess, it's fine. I'm just curious because I get to fight this almost every day. When I even mention the word marketing, I get a reaction of like, Adam, you're in the wrong function. Did you want to talk about our customers? <laughs> what, what say you, Bill? Uh, yeah, a couple things there. I mean, Number one, how organizations design and and build their organizations differs, right? How you, like if I said who reports to a marketing department, everyone will have a little bit of variation. But I found two things. I I would venture to guess about 80% of companies, and I'd I'd say medium to large size companies, um, have different groups. You know, some of them have a different PR group, a different employee communications group, a different marketing group. Some even have a different social media group, right? So... And I, and I think the challenge is what I've found is sometimes those groups don't even report into the same C-suite person, right? So now you might have some people reporting into HR, some people reporting into public affairs, some people reporting into marketing or branding. Um, and it just gets to be pretty difficult trying to have that one brand presence and tailoring it per audience in, in that makeup. I wanted to tell you a funny story too, though. Um, in almost every presentation I do to employee groups or even externally, I do a quick poll. That's how I open my, my presentations. And the poll is pretty much, which audience do you think is the most important? And I list employees, customers, the press, investors, um, and labor unions. I think those are the five I put on there. And we could spend a whole hour arguing one of those are the most important. Um, but I will tell you, you know, nine out of 10 people pick customer which is how we're trained, right? The customer is the most important, which is which is really important. And another 10, 15% will pick um, investors, right? Because that makes the stock go up or down for a public company. And, I, and I, I don't argue with people, but to me, it's employees. If you have happy, well-served, well-messaged and understood culture and, and goals, they will in turn serve customers better. Better served customers will buy more. The stock price will go up, right? Labor unions won't be so, you know, upset, the press will at least be hearing, if not reporting about culture and good things that are happening at that company. So it's an interesting poll, though, to ask as you get a wide variety of answers. Uh, Common sense is often not common action. You're absolutely (laughs) right on the words, but you're actually doing it and you're all listening. I'm not going to leave Bill with just that. I'm going to stress test all of what he just said because that's unbelievable. But before we close off, you said 80%. uh, My data Uh, just based on the podcast of 400 more organizations would be much bigger number than 80% Mm. are in a position where the audiences are divided. Doesn't mean that isn't, they want it to be united. Yeah. But the gap, the bridge that you need to walk on, that you need to create to get there is often feels insurmountable. Now, when let's talk about in your case, 80%, I'm going to throw my number of 95% of current wow. state. Yeah, that's high. What it is high. It is. And again, it doesn't mean the innovators listening. I know you all agree and you want to change it and we are going to change it. So I'm going to go further and say, we're going to change that percentage, but it'll take time. Bill, when we look at that 80 or 95% in my view, current state, how would you describe what that does to the organization at the highest level when you are this 
I think you used the word fractured. Yeah, I mean, it, it, at 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 best, it makes it it adds. I call it taxes. It adds tax taxes or complexity to making sure you have integrated messaging. And and don't get me wrong, you know, or like every organization can have different organization charts and who reports to whom and all that kind of stuff. But typically, again, in medium to large size businesses, you have annual goals. And if I'm in my own marketing department or my own employee communications department, my goals are all going to be about employee communications. And therefore, the integration across the other audiences becomes a secondary, if anything, effort, right? Because, hey, I got to make sure my boss understands what my goals are and I'm achieving my goals. Oh, yeah, I got to go work with the PR team, the, you know, the investor team, the, the government relations team, too. But you're not really kind of motivated to have that integration. And I, so I'd say, you know, at a minimum, it's difficult. At a, at a maximum, you have this problem where advertising is giving this message. Employees are hearing this message. The news media is getting this message. And you get, like you just said, I think a good word is fractured messaging. Right. And so now what do you, you know, in the world of, you know, seven touches to really understand and take an action on something in our personal lives or work lives. Right. Um, whether that's engagement or interactions. Think about that if you're if you're firing off five or six different messages in the different groups. I make the case that organizations are often the biggest spammers in the life of employees. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, and I think you also mentioned, I'm just looking at my notes, you mentioned tyranny of urgent when you are this fractured and you're now, like, what did you mean by that? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of twofold. Again, all of us have, uh, the, the, one of the reasons why I love the industry we're in is never, you know, the day's never the same and you never know what's going to pop up uh, when, when something starts. And so, um, and so you, with that in mind, you're going to have the tyranny of the urgent. And again, if your goals are solely in a siloed marketing department or communications department, what are you going to work on? You're going to work on those things. You're not going to be working on integrated messaging or anything like that. The other part of it, though, and, and we'll, I think we'll get into org structure a little bit more, but tyranny of the urgent, there is a downside to the integration of all these departments. And that one downside to me has been you can't ignore crisis. And crisis comes in a million different ways, a really angry customer, um, uh, you know, a hurricane at a site. You, you name the type of crisis. Um, and you do have to spend, you can't ignore those, right? So you do have to spend a lot of time managing crisis versus what I call playing offense, right? Whereas if you were just the marketing department, unless it was a customer thing, you wouldn't be as worried about what's happening in the news and what's happening with employees. Um, you'd still continue with your marketing department. So, but tyranny of the urgent, I think is um, something that rings a bell with any, any communicator or any marketer. Um, we all go through it every day. What crisis in your industry now when you're sending rockets into spaceship, everything is predictable. There's probably no surprises whatsoever in your world. <laughs> Never. Yeah, no. You know, planes take off and, and, and rocket ships go into space. There's never, you know, there's never a crisis. It's well, it's fascinating. And I, I know anyone who's listening who works in a medium to large size company is nodding their head saying, yeah, we have a lot of those. And they're, and they're random and unpredictable. I'm going to ask the next question for you to be kind of the judge and jury of this one. This is a big heated debate, which is the following. Can we uh, delete the word marketing when we're talking about employees? So in other words, I have a, a divided audience. There are those who say adopting marketing is critical because marketing is how do you connect with people? How do you meet them where they are? How do you, all of what we know on the positive, yeah, there's negative side of marketing. And they're saying, Adam, do not let go of the word marketing. On the other side, I have those who say, absolutely, you go to a conference, do not say marketing. You're going to scare some HR folks away immediately because marketing means some. Bill, uh, please be the judge and jury of this one. I really don't know where you're going to go with this, but do I, do I tame the term marketing? I think, gosh, I'll, boy, I'll punt this one a little bit. I, I, as a personal employee of a company, Am I insulted when someone says you know, we need to market to employees? Maybe. And so I can see the reaction of marketing or the word market, right, as kind of a maybe a little bit of a dirty word. But in, in the spirit of our discipline, since the beginning of time, right, someone has always been trying to deliver a message to someone else or to an audience, right? Whether that's to a, a wife, a child, a business, a customer, an employee, you're still trying to um, 
deliver a message. And in and, and my definition of marketing, you're, you're marketing to that person. You're hoping to catch that person at the right moment with the right message so he or she can take an action. And again, that goes back to the, you know, the dawn of the ages to, to today. Of course, today there's a multitude of ways to do that. It's super exciting. But that fundamental message delivery to me is marketing. You didn't pun it. You made you made a, a decision. You, you said, "Hey, listen, listen. Think about it. If you want to send the right message to the right person at the right time, the people who do that, the discipline that does that, is marketing." Yeah, and and I, I think it's just definitions too. Like in you know ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty years ago, marketing or advertising was its own thing, and it w- it had a it had a definition, right? I'm buying something. To That's advertise, right. try and get you to do something. I just think if, if you if you do audience first, uh, you're trying to get the right message to the right audience in the moment that they need it the most quickly, and and that's kind of my philosophy on things. Boom! For those audiences who are against the use of marketing, you heard it. We are going to we're going to keep it. Uh, 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 Bill, thank you. Uh, I'm glad it came on that side. All right. So now we're going to talk about people, process, technology. So first is the people. Uh, at the most leadership level, right? Because I often hear culture, everyone, internal communication, everyone, you know, who's responsible. And in your case, we have one, unify all audiences under one team. How does that happen? How does an organization break the, you know, momentum inertia of the dual audiences of all of the th- complexities and the muscle memory of the organization? in order to get there, what needs to be true for this to transpire? I I think, you know, I'll generalize this. I think it's one of two ways. One is your leadership. So the CEO, the leader, the C-suite, that person um, has to understand communicating, marketing, the various audiences, the levers you need to pull when you're trying to get a message out, who needs to hear it and what detail and how and when. I will tell you the other way too is, um, uh, and this is actually a, a, a really fascinating story of, of Intel many, many years ago, which I can talk about. But the other one is sometimes crisis drives that need, right? So you have a major crisis. And, and, and for those of us, you know, I'm old enough to remember the Pentium flaw at Intel. It was a flaw that in reality, no normal PC owner would ever run into, but it just blew up as a crisis in the news media, right? So suddenly you're dealing with, and I'll stop there, but you're dealing with a crisis and suddenly you realize, oh my gosh, employees are wondering what the heck's going on. Customers are calling us saying, you know, am I going to get my product or, you know, what's going on? Investors want to know, is this financially material, right? In some cases, you might have some type of government aspect if you're, you know, being uh, regulated. Um, you know, I'm just going through my suppliers, right? Go through your audiences. And so if you're really highly fractured, I have seen at companies and read about companies that the crisis is what people pull back from and said, hey, what could we do differently? Well, my gosh, we had five organizations all developing their own messages, all trying to get back to their audiences. It was very fractured, very different messaging. Let's think about one holistic department or organization that can understand the high level message. And then you go tailor that message to those audiences. But the spirit of the main message is in everything that you do. It's one crisis with many sides. And, and, yeah. and I'll use the, uh, another term, maybe not a synonym, but close for me is a burning platform. It may not be a crisis. It could be, a, a, you know, you're trying to improve your customer service. You're trying to race with your re- product release. Maybe the revenue, revenue is, is a challenge. Whatever is that retention, um, it's, it, it has many faces of the same a business objective. So, Bill, when we think about this one team, does it then become multiple teams? Is it, so this is basically one team across, and now there's an HR piece, and then there is an external marketing piece. Walk us through this, the architecture of this type of organization at, at the highest level. At what point does the audience nuances where it starts to uh, split up? Yeah, I mean, you still there's still specific talent you need um, in specific department, right? So at the highest level, you need a, a external news media team, and I'll get back to that in a minute. You need an executive communications kind of internal team. Uh, you need, and this is a wide word, right? A marketing team, whether that's advertising, website, you know, whatever those aspects are, um, and then you need the creative team, 
because you, especially in this day and age, we all know, right? Content is king and queen. You know, if you don't have content, you don't have, you know, much of a message. So at, at the highest level, it's those things. And then the fifth one to me is um, you definitely need an analytics team because I think you need that group separate measuring things as opposed to us measuring ourselves and saying, hey, we're great, pat on the back. Um, and so under those groups, you need different talent, right? Like, Think about it if in any group, you, anybody, if you took a really good creative person and said, hey, I want you to go handle crisis management or, hey, I want you to write a speech for uh, for our CEO uh, who's speaking at an event in a week or two. There, there's not that talent. You, you, you rarely find you talk about unicorns. You're really going to find someone who's left brain and right brain. Right. Can totally. deal with process and complex issues and is also creative. Um, and so you do need specific talent, you know, whether that's writing, messaging like we just said, video, design, all of that stuff. So, but those are kind of the four core areas of the team and, and they are different teams, but they all roll up into one organization. Excellent. Let, let's turn that attention now toward the internal audiences. Tell me if you think about this the same way and if you do, how do you, how do you approach it? So when I think about the employee experience, right, I ask myself, what would be the, the utopian vision? And as a marketer, I would say all touch points to be relevant, to be personalized. Okay, but you can't start there. That's a pretty tall order. So why don't we at least think about which employee experiences or moments that matter are critical to, to nail first. And in my mind, it would be ranging from, yes, I agree, the onboarding, making sure the candidate experiences, then internal communications. You don't nail internal comms. What, what do you have if you're not able to? And then thereafter, maybe you go into benefits. Do you go into performance management? How do you think about the moments that matter from applying the resources to be able to improve the employee experience? Yeah, I, gosh, first impressions, right, matter in all of our lives, whether business or personal. I, I think that employee, new employee orientation um, is hugely critical to set that. And I, I'll never forget it. Um, Intel dedicates a whole day, and it might have been a day and a half when I started, to just employee orientation. You lead, and, and by the way, the CEO at the time carved out every other, it was every other Monday, the orientation, the CEO would come and speak. And the CEO would speak about the rich tradition and history of the company, right? You'd block out an hour or two with specialists in the room to say, here's how you do your benefits, whether it's banking, dental, however. Um, and you just learn a lot about the company. So I, I think you want to over emphasize orientation blue origin does a fun, almost the same thing it's it's actually spread over two days but half a day each um, so i think that's critical and then I, i'm with you i'll just go back to what we talked about um, earlier about marketing right is is internal communications and employee communications or employee hr marketing this gets into then how do you segment audiences right mm -hmm. so you talked about this right you don't want to blast all ten thousand hundred thousand employees mm -hmm. every day with multiple messages Right. So you have to do some some curating. And to me, you have to do audience segmentation. So we talk a lot about two things. One is, is this HR communications and it's coming from HR. Right. Is it informative or is it storytelling? So informative would be, hey, we just hired someone. Um, hey, the cafeteria has a new menu. Uh, storytelling, though, is really promoting our brand. And when I say it's one brand, it's promoting, you know, our passion for mission and, and benefiting Earth. Those are our two big, big focus areas. Um, so you do that, right? Inform is are we informing or storytelling? And then two is what's the what's the audience, right? You don't you start with does this need to go to just managers, just one team, just one person, the whole employee base, and you just make sure you have a consistent plan. And uh, you know I can't emphasize this enough: a seat at the table with HR, a seat at the table with the sales team, and you're partnering. Um, and all you know these are daily conversations. It's not just kind of transactional. Hey, from a, a week from now, we need to run a advertising campaign. Two weeks from now, we have to talk about a new employee being hired, that kind of thing. I just want to just hone in just a bit there because that's super powerful. So what we're saying is you have an event that just happened, right? Maybe you hired someone. Maybe there's something that, that's, that's impactful and you're looking to communicate it. The current state is informative, which is 10,000 emails, we just did this and here is a message that applies to no one resonates with no one uh, maybe it's a little too much resonates with no one i shouldn't say that resonates with some people but it's for everybody moving that to storytelling via segmentation you can now say this event 
how does it impact different segment groups? If you're a manager, it may impact you this way. Let's send you a communication that is more, maybe it's not all managers either. Maybe it's managers in that division or in that functional area of the organization. If we just brought on someone senior inside engineering, probably means more to the engineering. Maybe we talk about the philosophy of that person on the product roadmap versus for our customer success team. It means something a little bit different. So let's modify yeah. for them. Am I, how far down bill would you want to go if the technology, and I assume the technologies are either there or will be there and we're participating. And I know Microsoft is, there's a lot of folks looking to provide solutions to do that. So how far would you go? Yeah, and I, I want to say this, that um, by no means are we perfect at this. Um, at Blue Origin, we weren't perfect at it, Honeywell or Intel. So tons of work to do. But yeah, I mean, this is where you go backwards. You know, you think backwards or outside in, I guess, is the, the buzzword people use. You're an employee. How does an employee want to receive his or her updates, right? What What's their favorite venue to, to is it video? Is it a short thing? Is it a... a a meeting, right? Is it a one-on-one? -on -one? There's a multitude of ways. So you say, how far I want to go? Boy, Nirvana would be, you have 10,000 employees and you have 10,000, you know, if there's 10,000 different ways that that employee refers, which is crazy, but refers to get their message in this specific way, you can do that, right? Amazing. Mary over here only likes to hear verbally from her manager. Um, Bob over here likes big group emails that you can, or, or, you know, you name it, IMs, whatever those venues are. Um, you could get into some really tailored messaging. And, and I will say we are we are doing that. So I'll make up an example. Let's say the example is we need to produce 15% more engines due to a higher customer demand. We will tailor a message. Again, this is going to audience tailoring where the engines team gets a very specific message on how to do that. But then the supply chain gets the same message, right? We need to increase our rate, if you will, but they get theirs tailored to what the supply chain can do. The sales team gets the same message, but very specific on, hey, go, go market this or go advertise or go do these type of engine sales versus this area. Um, you get into, like I said, you don't only segment, but you get into tailored messaging um, per segment internally. And you did say you're not perfect. So I kind of won the argument to you that you're not a unicorn. I'm, I'm kidding, Bill. No, no. I'm, I, I think no, the no. debate is still out. Uh, <laughs> But, but, but I'll take, take you further into the employee experience to ask the question in the following way, which is what aspects of employee experience you don't think that your team, for example, learning and development, change management, do you think all the touch points should be under this team? Or do you think there's certain employee experience moments that matter that shouldn't be a part of this team? You know, it gets into the definition of, of what you mean by experience. Um, you know, my, my take, and it may be right or wrong, is there are some in-depth, deep experts that understand organizations, understand people, understand human resources, all of those things. And this gets back to what I said up front. I mean, working for these incredibly smart people has been just a blessing in my career. Um, and so I think a lot of it drives from those experts but there's a collaboration there to be in the room from the start, right? And so you're, you're, you know, you're getting the expert opinion and then you're giving your opinion. Well, this is how I think we can communicate it. Have you thought about this? I think one of the most underrated values of a PR or an internal comms person is the um, external uh, voice that they can give. Because we're, you know, we're, we know what the press is reporting. We typically know how employees are feeling and what they're doing. So you may have the greatest plan from an HR person or a salesperson, but you might contribute and say, well, did you know that this is going on or this happened two months ago? Let's tweak this or let's consider that uh, different aspects of it. But again, long answer to say, I think, you, you know, there's experts in the company on experience. You just work as a team to, to figure out how the best way to form it and communicate it. I'm going to put it in, in different words and check in with you on that because it's the same question. I think it's super important to have some clarity. So marketers help connect the message to the audience, right? Right message, right person, right time. They absolutely do not have subject matter expertise across many areas, such right. as learning and development, let's take as an example, or, or even change management, either one. Put us Put a marketing team in the room with learning and development from the beginning of that initiative and help marketing figure out how to connect, starting with getting folks involved in the learning initiative, getting them onboarded. Then how do you think about 
reaching them where they are in order to continue their journey in learning. Bill, am I putting it into, is, am I tracking? Where, where you're you're good. You're a good message person. You nailed it. Yeah. That's <laughs> a, a great way to articulate it. Thank you. <laughs> It's just, it's just uh, this, this line should be very clear that marketers would not be coming in to take over the world of HR. They're just right. there to support the touch point, that connection, connective tissue. But it's not just that. That's a big thing to meet people where they are. Uh, well, I want to ask you more questions than I'm just fully caffeinated today, Bill, and, and super ins inspired by the conversation. Um, I want to talk about something that you did pretty early on where you started to look at data of videos. When you started thinking about like a marketer by evaluating the impact of initiatives. So I'd love to hear about that because ultimately I think the world of initiatives is desperately lacking data. And marketers can bring a lot to the table to say, here's how we think about data. We don't wait until someone just purchases and that's how we count. We do a lot more. What do we do, Bill? Yeah. How do we bring it internally? Uh, again, I, I said this up front, the, the fact that our discipline, whether that's communications, PR, marketing, whatever you want to call it, has gone digital, it's measurable, and you can speak in a language that CFOs, CEOs, C-suite people understand, and you can get insights and quickly act on it. I call it actionable analytics, right? Move quickly. But I think the example we talked about was, um, and again, you'll hear this term VOC, voice of the customer, and it's hugely popular in you know, customer experience organizations, marketing, traditional marketing organizations. But it applies to every audience, right? What do employees want to hear about? How do they digest their information and their storytelling? And so the story I told was, again, this was based on a, a survey we did. Again, just in your personal lives, how do you digest and receive news? And you get all this feedback back. And surprising to me, because I wasn't wired this way when we did the poll, it was heavy on a video. I, I, I like to consume video, which surprised me. But so what we did at Honeywell then was said, okay, let's, if that's the case, let's develop our own, uh, you know, 10 o'clock news video production. Um, we did it once a week. We wanted to, we made sure, and by the way, the survey said, I don't want an hour program or a half hour program. I want to digest in one to two minutes, three minutes. So we would do literally like a, a newscast that you'd see on your local TV. It had a desk. It had a couple of anchors, if you will, that we had rotating in. You do this newscast once a week three to four minutes long, that would be storytelling. And it blew, the, the data just blew the doors off of any of our expectation. It quickly became exponentially the most popular way to speak to all employees at Honeywell Aerospace. Um, and so it's, it's an example of that data. And then you'd get data on that, on that video on this was the most popular story. So let's do a, po a follow up. This was the least popular or, you know, we saw a lot of drop off at the end of the video. Let's think about that. And you're just constantly iterating and analyzing and acting on, on the data that you're getting. Ooh, season four is going to be all about campaigns and we're going to be looking at data and impressions. Oh, that's going to be perfect. All right, Bill, I, I wish I scheduled four hours of your time, not, not, not the 45 minutes. So I want us to at least touch on technology. Like we understand that there's people process technology and externally imagining a world without ads and, and, and all of the automation, marketing automation tools and all of the ways how we can make it relevant and A-B test and, and have journeys and mapping. And I mean, I can't even imagine. Internally, we have some tools, but it's still early days in my view because the vast majority are not doing this. What do you think technology should do? What's the job we want it to do in order for us to be able to meet them where they are in order to take care of them the way we take care of our customers? Yeah, and I think we talk, talked about this when we when we first met. The, yep. You know, the, the funny story I told was was when a recruiter calls me and says, well, I want to find out how, how big your department is and how many years of experience you have and what your budget is. And, and I always answer the same way, right? My job is to do things for the lowest budget possible, highest ROI, um, and, and same with people, right? As productive as possible. But I also say, I, I only have three years of experience and you get a gasp, um, but three it's years. my- Wait. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. You know, I'm trying to hire a CMO and you, you're saying you have three years of experience. Any, I, I just believe with the way how rapidly technology is evolving, and I'll give a great example that we'll all nod to in a minute, um, 
very few people outside of being a message expert, very few people can say they have more than three years experience in marketing or communications. It's changing that fast. And the example I give is find me a communications HR CEO, name the department, right? That was using AI or knew of AI two to three years ago, you know, and then find me an expert on the whole idea of how you write correctly to get the right answer from AI, right? There's a whole new job for people, totally. right? Que querying, you need experts that query and, you know, and, and that's my biggest example. Um, no one had that experience two, three years ago. No one in my department or anyone's department was doing that much, right? And so now all of a sudden you're doing something that you weren't doing three years ago. And I always say about half of what we're doing today, um, we weren't doing two or three years ago. So that's kind of the high level um, approach to, to, to that answer. Um, I don't know if you want me to get into more specifics on, on that whole topic or not. You know, I wonder if we could do anything in, in broad strokes because as a, externally, when we think about marketing, what capabilities would we need internally? Because well, I'm with you. Like, I think you call them query prompt engineers. I think AI is definitely going to be a part of the equation. Um, but beyond that, do we? You, you mentioned early in our interview, you said seven times. To, 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 before we even hear the message the first time. Well, that means the, how do we deliver it and what channels, what are the channels internally? What What is an equivalent of an Instagram and Facebook and Google internally? Where, let me ask you that, Bill, actually. Let's start there. What channels do you think we will be sending channels in? Uh, well, I guess I'll maybe blow people's mind here, but we've had strategic conversations in my past what if LinkedIn was our internal channel? You know, oh. now you can't give up confidential information, right? Obviously, but go to where the people are and, and, you know, Honeywell into all these companies have massive amounts of people on LinkedIn. So I, I would say your channel isn't necessarily just internal, internal channels. I, I would think, you know, think about LinkedIn, think about some other things that you're communicating where people really like to receive their stuff, right? I'm always on Instagram, so I'm seeing stuff from Blue Origin or Honeywell or whomever. Um, so that's one. But two is I, I'm with you, right? There's this there's this study, and I'm going to butcher the name of it, but it's, you know, seven, the power of seven in marketing, right? And seven engagements before someone takes an action, whether that's to buy, to do something, to advocate, whatever that is. And so, you know, again, we're heavy. We're trying to get heavier on video because that's what the data says on consumption from from our employees and from the general public. You have chat. You, I mean, you have all kinds of different venues. You have town halls, one on ones, coffee talks. I mean, there's a multitude of things. And so when you're developing a campaign, again, don't automatically default to this has to go to all 100,000, 200,000 employees. It doesn't. So, OK, where does it need to go to and how do you get to that kind of seven exposures uh, to an employee. So everyone really kind of understands it. And then the biggest thing is, as you talked about change management early, don't walk away from it. Keep in mind, I think, I think the um, attrition rate for marketers and IT people right after COVID was like 20%, 20, 25%. I mean, everyone was switching companies or didn't want to work anymore or whatever, wanted to be a contractor. So I, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, okay, we did this change management. We have this new process. Let's launch it. But in two and a half years, 50% of the people in the room aren't going to be there anymore. Or my math's off, probably a little bit less or a little bit more. But my point is, so you can't just sit there and say, I sent my email telling everyone this is the new process or this is the new uh, way we're doing HR or this is the new way we're doing anything because number one, not everyone reads an email. Number two, 50% uh, of those people may not be at the company two, three, four years from now. So it's this constant, you know, we talked about this a lot. You have to be annoyingly boring in your messaging. And, and I never really got that. We had one CEO who was terrific at this at Honeywell and he keep repeating the same phrases and it would be like, you'd almost start eye rolling, but then you realized he was doing this on purpose. You have to keep pounding messages over and over and over again for people to understand. It's the game of telephone when we were kids. I don't know if you played it, oh, you know, where you whisper a message, it goes around the table, it comes back and someone is either purposely changing that message or it just gets lost in translation around the table. This is life for communicators, right? You can't sit there and just say, okay, I told the guy next to me or the gal next to me, right? And therefore I'm set. Well, no, because it's going around 10 more people and whether purposeful or by accident, you're getting a whole different message back. The words you used, I'm going to go back in the transcript. You said annoyingly re repetitive. What were the words you used? 
Yeah. Annoyingly repetitive is a, is oh a good phrase. God. Yeah. I mean, that's perfect. That is perfect. All right. With the time we have, I think I can squeeze in two more questions. All right. I'll uh, answer the, quickly. <laughs> the, the first question, Bill, is you intentionally or not refer to it as a campaign. And what's interestingly, I've been recently often refer- thinking about initiative versus a campaign. Are we moving from the way HR has thought about an initiative where it's compliance, where it's informative, and moving into a campaign the way a marketer would think about it, which is you have a very focused objective, certain the time from zero to completion, and how do we look at performance of this? Did we succeed? What is the desired behavior that we took on? Bill, how would you describe the difference between an initiative and a campaign? I think an, an initiative is an effort to, it's like an objective. You're, there's an effort to try and move a needle. Uh, your initiative might be win the Super Bowl. Um, ensure the company understands that sustainability or safety is job one. That's an initiative. Um, I can see the, the word campaign being a marketing campaign, but I like that word because to me, a campaign typically has a start and a stop and you nailed it. It has me- metrics and findings and insights to it. Right. So I, you know, but, but I have a bias, you know, I've, I've done a lot of marketing. And so campaign is a, a, a word I use pretty often, but I think they're different, right? You have a, an objective or a goal an initiative, right? And we're going to do it over the next six months. We're going to teach everyone about how, you know, a new safety mechanism at the company, for, for example, but you have campaigns on how to go do that. And they're measurable and you're, you know, you're adding value or you're reiterating to make sure you're adjusting your campaign to make sure it's hitting home with the most people you want to influence. That was one of my most profound moments over the last few months is reflecting on the difference between initiative and a campaign, which is why the next season is entirely dedicated to campaigns with objectives and data points, which leads me, Bill, to kind of my my final question and one again that is uh, there's a lot of debate, maybe in some ways heated debate. Does the future of people initiatives, right, does it require marketers to be helping, supporting, driving it. And, and, and I'm not saying they're going to be the new CHROs or the new chief people officers, although I have met them. I have now seen CEOs go to their marketing folks and say, you are now the next chief people officer. Do what you did there here to this audience because it's really important to us. But I'm not going that far. I'm, I'm simply asking the question, can people, future people initiatives, can HR leaders get to where we want them to go, where we see it, which is to run campaigns, without bringing on the marketing um, expertise and experience? I, I, my thought there was the, the future communicator or market. So I think it's heated because we're using the word marketing or marketer. Yes. Um, so if we set that word aside for a minute, to me, the, the future communicator or marketer or whomever is a combination of a quasi-journalist, so outstanding message maker and writer, IT person, understanding digital, how that works and the ins and outs of, of, of KPIs and all of those things. And yes, a marketer, right? How do I find the right audience at the right time to deliver the right message? Um, that to me is, you know, if I could go back and maybe I can even start this now, I'd, be, I'd like to be much more IT savvy. Um, journalism trained, have a lot of experience, you know, moving forward. But I don't have it on IT. And I, that's to me the, the consummate future person. And then you could say that person could be a, a, a CMO, an HR leader, um, an IT leader, right? You're, 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 a lot of the functions um, that companies have, that experience would be packaged up pretty well in, in quite a few organizations. Uh, what an amazing yeah. response. I'm going to ponder afterwards. Uh, Bill, is there anything I, di- I, I didn't ask or you wanted to share before we call it? Because I wish we had more, more than one hour. No, I, I, I just appreciate the time. Uh, I love what you're doing in terms of having these discussions. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Oh, Bill, thank you for joining. And for all of you listening in, you remember the question? I hope you remember the question I asked in the beginning. Did I prove Bill doesn't exist? Or, or did Bill show <laughs> pave the way for how this can be done? I do think Bill, Bill did a pretty good job. But you tell me in the comments below. Uh, do subscribe if you haven't already. I'm committed to a daily short every morning at 7 a.m. Eastern time. And I'm off to San Francisco. I'm going to be asking the same question over again. What is the future of people initiatives? What is the future of HR? And I will be sharing what I learn 
uh, as we begin to announce season four campaigns, we have exciting campaigns coming up. I just got word one organization is going company wide, 3000 employees for five weeks. We're going to measure ENPS. We have campaigns on strategy and how to connect developers to frontline businesses. There's all kinds of exciting things, but enough. I've had too much coffee. Bill, thank you for joining and all the audience folks. Thank you for tuning in. Look forward to it. Take care. Bye, Bill.